we're going to talk about lung volumes and capacities done by simple spirometry. First of all, we need to talk about predicted values. Predicted values are determined by a number of factors. In other words, predicted meaning that they did a survey or data collection of healthy individuals of all sizes, shapes, ages, sexes, races, and they put them all into a, a database. As we do pulmonary function testing and we do measurements from the individual, we're going to compare those measurements to the database and come up with a percent predicted value. And so this is the way they get the predicted. This is the way they categorize the people by age, by height, by weight, by gender, and by race. So the way these things affect their pulmonary functions are that age has, the older the people are, the lower the predicted values they have. Taller persons have larger predicted values. And so as we put in the height to these machines or we do these calculations, it may be either in inches or in centimeters. So the conversion there is one inch is equal to 2.54 centimeters. The weight is typically in kilograms, although pay attention, it may be in pounds too. And of course you change, you may need to change between pounds and kilograms. Females typically have smaller lung volumes. And I think race, a relatively new factor, this is more about leg length than anything else. Because the longer your legs are for your, for your height, as we mentioned earlier, the shorter your chest is. And so the shorter your chest, the lower the lung volumes. So there, there are some regions even even in this country where you have a, a shorter statue like the natives of Alaska, they're real stocky and have shorter legs than say someone from Africa that has that is tall and slender and has long legs. That that's what they're talking about there when they say race, that's what they're looking at. The smoking history. We're always gonna take a smoking history, ask them if they smoke. And not only ask them if they smoke now, have they smoked in the past? And in doing so, we want to record how many pack years, right? So also we need to differentiate whether it's cig cigarettes, cigars, or pipes. Which one's best? I don't know. At least the cigarettes, most of them have a filter on them. For an example of a calculation for pack year history. A patient who has smoked two packs of cigarettes per day for the last 20 years, how would you document the smoking history? So you take the number of packs per day multiplied by the number of years smoked and that will give you the pack year history. And so in this case that's 2 times 20, 2 packs per day times 20 years is equal to a 40 pack year smoking history. Now in preparation for these tests, medications are important because many times we're looking to see how effective the medications are. And so we need to hold these medications for a minimum of four hours. Eight is better before the testing on the patient if, if they have an inhaled sympathomimetic like albuterol. The short acting stuff Short-acting theophylline preparations should be held 12 hours before testing. Long-acting theophylline should be held 24 hours. And so I've actually seen a test, a question on the test like this about um, somebody that got short-winded standing waiting for a bus because of the fumes and they took their inhaler on the way to do these tests. What would you do? You either have to wait out the length of the medicine or 
or more likely probably just reschedule the test. Contraindications for spirometry testing, hemoptysis in the past 24 hours. Uh, simply because for one thing is you need to be concerned about the hemoptysis and that pro is probably a priority. But in addition, you don't want blood contaminating your equipment. If their vital signs are unstable, you have more pressing issues. If they're un unable to cooperate, whether it's sensorium or size, uh, size becomes a factor when you have a body box, when you're trying to use the body box. And, you know, they, they may be too large to actually fit inside the body box. And then even if they're not obese, then you have the claustrophobia issue to deal with there too. So sometimes not everybody's able to use these body boxes. So lung volumes and capacities. Well, what's the difference between a volume and a capacity? A capacity has two or more volumes in it. All right, so we're going to talk about these individually. Reporting values, all spirometry values are measured at ambient temperature and pressure saturated. In other words, they're at room air. And the values need to be reported at body temperature because that's, that's where the lungs are is in the body. And they're, you know, they're at 37 degrees or 98.6 degrees Fahrenheit where your room is probably in the mid-70s, low to mid-70s. Fahrenheit. So you always have to have this conversion. The slow vital capacity. The definition here is a maximum expiration followed by maximum inspiration. And in this case, the term slow describes the effort. So this is not of maximum effort. We'll talk about that in a minute. But this is measured with a spirometer attached to a recorder and recorded in liters or milliliters corrected to BTPS. So what it means by corrected to BTPS is we took the ambient value, multiplied it by the correct factor, and that changes it to BTPS, to body temperature pressure saturated value. During this slow vital capacity, we measure the vital capacity, the tidal volume, the inspiratory capacity, the expiratory reserve volume, and the inspiratory reserve volume. The vital capacity itself, the definition is, like we just said, maximum inspiration followed by maximum expiration. And the typical value is about 4,800 mLs, or 4.8 liters. And I, I know you've, you've heard a number of times, this is the typical value for vital capacity, or tidal volume is 500. Egan gives specific values for, you know, a 20 year old, 150 kilogram person. And sometimes they're not even close to the values that you, you hear all the time. So make sure and, and pay attention there to the, the values that Egan gives you. For the vital capacity, the significance is the decrease in, of the value in a restrictive disease. Okay, and so what that means is decreased volumes is equal to restrictive lung disease. And so the vital capacity is the capacity that you look at to diagnose, to identify restrictive diseases. So what are restrictive diseases? Remember that CBABE are the obstructive ones and everything else is restrictive. So we're not trying to necessarily identify the disease here, but is it obstructed or restricted? So here's a graph, I, graph I've known you know you've seen many many times, and what I'm going to do I'm I'm just going to color it in as we go through these different volumes and capacities. We're talking about the vital capacity here, so that includes this measurement. And so over on the left-hand side, you can see that it's, that it's the ERV, the tidal volume, and the IRV. And in the tracing, it, it includes the big breath there, that maximum breath. 
all right so that's what we're looking at right there is that one breath that's where you get this measurement so what we're going to do with this additionally we're going to carve this thing up and come up with a different volumes and capacities as we do this so we just need to do this one test and we'll come up with all of these lung volumes and capacities except for the residual volume and anything that contains a residual volume so in other words if, if you're looking at the FRC with simple spirometry you can't get the FRC because it contains the residual volume the TLC also contains the residual volume so we can't get those doing simple spirometry we'll talk about ways to get that shortly The tidal volume, this is normal resting breathing, and this needs to be an average over several breaths. This tidal volume is useful in calculating the minute ventilation. Tidal volume times the respiratory rate is the minute ventilation. The typical value is about a half a liter, and significance is, is it's decreased with restrictive diseases. And so right here, is the typical starting position except for that vital capacity that we just did but for the rest of them this resting end expiratory level is the starting position this is where we start from all right so th this is the volume that we're looking at is the tidal volume and you see uh, now obviously this is hand drawn and all the tidal volumes are consistent that's probably not going to be the case when you when you do your tests all right you have to be very good at doing this before before you can get that consistent the inspiratory capacity the definition here is the largest volume that can be inspired from a resting end expiration typical value is about 3.6 liters or 3600 milliliters the significance is it's decreased with restrictive disease and here's some different ways that you can calculate inspiratory capacity the IRV plus the tidal volume or vital capacity minus the ERV etc you can look at those there's a number of ways to come up with those, that value and so our starting position is resting expiratory level again and then it's everything above that, including the tidal volume and the IRV. Expiratory reserve volume. The definition here is the largest volume of gas that can be expired from a resting end expiratory level. The typical value is 1200 or 1 1.2 liters. And the significance is, is it's decreased with restrictive disease all right and the ERV is calculated by the vital capacity minus the inspiratory capacity or FRC minus the RV expiratory reserve all right, so our starting position is resting expiratory level and we're looking at this volume Now the IRV, the inspiratory reserve volume. This is the def the definition is the largest volume of gas that can be inspired above the normal tidal volume. And typical value is about 3,100 or 3.1 liters. It's decreased with restrictive disease. And there are some calculations that you can look at. So this one has a little bit different starting level too, uh, because we're going to start up here at the at the top of the tidal volume. In other words, this is everything we can inhale beyond the tidal volume. So another one with a different starting position. The FRC, the functional residual capacity. The definition here is the volume of a gas remaining in the lungs at the end expiratory level, including the residual volume. The typical value is about 2,400 mLs or 2.4 liters. The significance is it's decreased with restrictive disease and increased with obstructive disease due to air trapping. Calculation here is FRC is equal to the ERV plus the RV. And we got to keep this in mind. This is going to be an important calculation for us down the road when we're trying to evaluate the residual volume. 
So we're back to our graph, our starting position, and our volumes are the ERV and the RV. So this is the functional residual capacity. Now the total lung capacity. The definition here is the total amount of gas in the lungs following maximum inspiration. And so typical value is about six, six liters. The significance is it's decreased with restrictive disease and increased with obstructive disease. So the TLC, and again here you can add the four volumes together or any any version of, of a number of ways, the, the vital capacity plus a residual volume, but you can get it a number of ways. Let's, let's look at some. Okay, so this is the tidal volume. You add the different volumes together and you get total lung capacity. You can add the inspiratory capacity and the functional residual capacity or you can add the vital capacity and the residual volume. All right, but any way you look at it, it's everything. It's the total lung capacity, including the residual volume. The definition is the volume of gas in the lung at the end of maximum expiration. So this is the part that you can't exhale. Regardless of your effort, you can't exhale it. The typical value is about 1.2 liters. The significance is it's decreased with restrictive disease and it's increased with obstructive disease. And the residual volume here is the FRC minus the ERV. And again, this is just a, a rearrangement of our FRC calculation a while ago. And we're gonna use this more as we progress here. All right, so this is the volume that we're looking at. No, no starting level here because we can't exhale it. If you can't exhale it, you can't get it measured by simple spirometry. So if you can't exhale it, how do you measure it? Well, we have three different ways. We have helium dilution, the nitrogen washout, and the, and the body plasmography, or the body box. We're gonna talk about each of these individually. These are a little bit more complicated and they are not considered, they're considered indirect measurements. So the calculation of the RV is what I was just talking about here. In each of these three methods, the FRC is measured. So that's what we're gonna measure with these three. The ERV that was measured before doing the slow vital capacity is subtracted from the measured FRC and that's the way you come up with a residual volume. And then once you come up with the value for your residual volume, you can do all the calculations on the graph. So this is what we're measuring with these next three tests, the FRC. And so guess where our starting level is? Our starting level is always going to be the resting expiratory level. The helium dilution test. So guess what gas we use here? We use about 10% helium. All right, so what we have here is the patient rebreathes from a spirometer, a known concentration of helium, usually at 10%, mixed with room air for a period of up to seven minutes. All right, so we have to have a helium analyzer and we have to know the concentration and what we're gonna do here is we're just gonna have the patient breathe normally and mix this helium throughout the circuit. So as the test progresses, the helium is distributed throughout the patient's lung and the circuitry until equilibrium is established between the lungs and the spirometer. The switch in, which is a just a pulmonary function term for start the test, should occur at the end of normal expiration at the point where the FRC is only left in the lung. And so remember, that's what we're trying to, rem to measure is the FRC. So that's where we should begin the test is at the top of the FRC. 
the initial and final helium readings are measured with the helium analyzer and the values are used to measure the patient's FRC. So there's a statistical thing there that's done and they come up with a value for the FRC. And this is kind of what it looks like. So you see the top portion here, A, is where the patient is not breathing the helium yet. Noting the switch here. And in the circuitry here, we have a helium analyzer that's reading the helium concentration. We have some oxygen because this is, this is called a closed loop. Simply stated because you're going to be rebreathing this until the has equilibrated throughout the lungs and the circuitry. So as a consequence, as you consume oxygen out of it, the volume inside the circuitry is less. So you have to add a little bit of oxygen into the circuitry um, on occasion to make up for the, the lost volume. In addition, here you're going to have CO2 production and you're going to have the CO2 rebreathing that CO2 if you, if you don't remove it from the circuitry. So that's what the soda lime is for, is to remove the, C, the carbon dioxide. All right, so as we move down to B here, we switch them in, looking at the switch here. And so the patient just breathes back and forth through this normally until the helium equilibrates. Now, how do we know it is equilibrated? Okay, the end of the test is reached when the helium changes by less than 0.02% over a 30 second interval. Now this is changes by less than 0.02% over a 30 second interval, not when it measures 0.02%, but when it changes, because it might be, the final reading might be 5%, but it's not changing from that. So that that ends the test. Or seven minutes. For some reason, seven seems to be the magical number in pulmonary function testing. Pretty much none of our tests will last more than seven minutes. A consistent baseline should be maintained by adding small amounts of oxygen as the oxygen is consumed. If more and more oxygen is required to maintain the baseline and the helium fails to stabilize, there's probably a leak in the system. So using the helium dilution test, the FRC is a direct measurement. The RV is calculated then by FRC value minus the ERV. Now remember that the ERV was collected earlier doing our simple spirometry. So we, we go look at that value, subtract it from the FRC that we got here in this test, and have a residual volume. And then of course we can come up with the TLC by adding the vital capacity and the residual volume. The next test is a nitrogen washout. Measures the fol following volumes. It's the FRC, the RV, and the TLC. The FRC is going to be what we're, what we're after. So let me ask you this. What gas do you think we're going to use here? N not. We're going to use oxygen. 100% oxygen. Okay, so the patient breathes in 100% oxygen for up to seven minutes or until the percent nitrogen reading now measures less than 1% to wash out the nitrogen from the lungs. So this washout issue, remember in talking about oxygen therapy, remember that, that atelectasis caused by the nitrogen washout has always been a hazard but in this instance, in the pulmonary function lab, this is actually what we're trying to do, is what we're trying to accomplish. So we're trying to wash that nitrogen out so that we can get it measured. And when we, when we know how much nitrogen they've exhaled, down to 1%, we can do a calculation and come up with the FRC. So the normal person should wash out in three minutes or less. 
Obstructed patients, again, may not wash out completely even after seven minutes, but seven minutes is the max, maximum time. The switch-in occurs at the same spot at the end of normal expiration. The exhaled gases are collected into a spirometer or a bag, and the final percentage of nitrogen is used to measure the FRC. The RV is then calculated using the same technique as the helium dilution. So for this test, we have to have what we call a rapid response nitrogen analyzer. And it has to be in line and has to give us good readings there. So this is what it looks like here. This is another before and after. Before the test begins, you see that the switch is, is open here. Now, this is not a closed circuit, so we don't have to be concerned. In other words, no rebreathing occurs. So there's no concern here about CO2 and a baseline. But you see, at the very beginning of the test, the nitrogen concentration is high. And, and as you get it washed out, down here in B, where after we've opened the switched in, we've started the test, as you progress here, the nitrogen concentration gets lower and lower and lower. And of course, our goal is to get it down to 1% where we can end the test. Okay. So a, a rapid nitrogen analy analyzer is used and it's open circuit. So we don't have to be concerned about CO2 or baseline. This is a graph of the results of a nitrogen watch out. And this one is a normal graft. And, and you notice that on the vertical axis here, this is a logarithm tracing of the percentage of nitrogen. And logarithm meaning it it's, saves paper. In other words, you would have to have a very large sheet of paper to trace this if, if it wasn't logarithm paper. You see that every breath here this nitrogen concentration decreases a little by little by little by little by little until you get down to what? 1%, right? And then it's over. Some other things that might you might encounter here is analyzer failure. When you have that one sharp spike and then everything else is seems normal. So you have analyzer failure right there but it's going to mess up your calculation because we're going to measure the value under under each of these spikes under each of these breaths down in the left hand corner you see how this does it's where you're working your way down toward one percent and then suddenly the percentage increases again and starts working down again uh, this must you must have a leak in the system here um, because the nitrogen value that's the only way that the nitrogen value can increase where you're blowing it off again so this this one would indicate indicate a leak in the system and we got a leak where where the atmospheric pressure is getting in there somehow and then on the bottom right hand this is your obstructed patient and this is probably going to be at the end of seven minutes where it, they don't wash out after seven minutes if they're severely obstructed And then the body box, this is the third way. So typical measurements here is the FRC, the RV, and the TLC. Other measurements here, and the, re the reason we can do other things here is because of the, the theory behind the body box. Okay, so we refer to this as a thoracic gas volume, which is the equivalent to the FRC. That's actually what we're going to measure. The residual volume TLC percentage. And remember the typical value here for this percentage is 20 to 35 percent. As that value grows, they're more obstructed. You can also measure airway resistance. Okay. And this is kind of a blurry picture of a body box. But you see, you have to get them in there and you have to close the door 
and latch the door so that it's sealed tightly. So you can see how size might be an issue here if they can't fit in there or how claustrophobia might be an issue. Now they make some of these boxes that are pretty much all glass and so that helps relieve some of the claustrophobia but still you have people that are that can't get in it if you have to latch the door closed. Now in addition here you're gonna have a speaker that you visit with the patient through. So they they can't hear you so you have to engage the speaker so that so that you can actually talk through the the box here so that they can hear you. So here, here's a graphic of how the body box works. Okay, And so you have the patient sitting inside the box. You have a shutter here. And you have one pneumotack on, on the inside attached to the, the mouthpiece there, kind of. And then you have a second one attached to the wall of the box. And so we're going to use... We're going to compare the, the pressures and volumes on these two pneumatacs as the patient performs the test, and we're going to use Bull's Law to do the calculation. So the technique here for the body box is the patient breathes normally for several breaths, and then at end expiration, the same as all the other tests, the shutter closes. In other words, we the, shut, the switch in occurs. The shutter closes and now we have the patient pant. All right, once that shutter closes, there's no air movement allowed. They have to stay on the mouthpiece and they pant. <laughs> right? So the pressure transducer measures the pressure at the mouth, which is equal to the alveolar pressure, when there is no air flow. So pressure at the mouth is equal to the alveolar pressure. A second pressure transducer measures the pressure in the box, which is equal to the volume of gas in the thorax. So the pressure in the box is equal to the thoracic gas volume. And then you use Boyle's Law to calculate the thoracic gas volume. Now you probably need to go review your gas laws, all right? but we're not actually going to do this calculation. The software will do it for us. The good thing about the body box, and it's the gold standard, it's the standard at which everything else is measured against. It measures the trapped gases that are otherwise excluded from the FRC measurements by other procedures. And this is why it's the gold standard, because it can measure those trapped gases. In, so in a normal person, the FRC measurements should be similar regardless of the method used. So whether you're using the body box, a helium dilution, or the nitrogen washout, if they're otherwise healthy, the values are all going to be very similar. Okay. And this one actually requires careful instruction by the therapist. And it may be that, you know, because panting is, is not, panting is not something you do every day. And in addition, you may have to hold your cheeks tight because as you pant, Sometimes your, your cheeks will puff as, as you pant. See how this guy's doing with his cheeks? And notice also he's got nose clips on. Might need nose clips. And so th that eliminates that puffing of the cheeks problem.